The following program is made possible by friends and partners of the Quick Study Television Ministry. Thank you for your support. God used a famine to heal a family. That and more coming up. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemp. I'm Janice. And I'm Corey. And this is the Quick Study Program. We are taking you through the Bible in one year. 66 books written by 40 authors over thousands of years, yet all with the same theme. Now today, we begin the saga of Joseph's revelation. In fact, the famine draws out the family, drawn out for healing. This is what we're going to talk about today as Joseph begins to reveal himself to his brothers years later after they sold him into slavery. Mm -hmm. What a story. Mm -hmm. Genesis 42 to 44. Stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. Corey, Bible archaeology. Well, this really begins uh, really the life and the captivity of the Israelite nation in Egypt. So we're going to start to look at some of the religious influences and, uh, and other influences that this Egyptian culture had on the people of Israel. Some obvious ones and maybe some subtle ones as well. And, and it's interesting because the Egyptian culture changes yes, over the does. 400 years that Israel is there. And we, the culmination yes, of that is an exodus, which we'll get to mm -hmm. next week. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Bible challenge comes from Genesis chapters 42 through 44. Joseph had a meal prepared for his brothers. How many times more was Benjamin serving than his brothers? Two times more, five times more, or ten times more? Hmm. And of course, Joseph is, they don't know he's, it's his brother, and no. so he's showing bias. Very interesting. Stay there as we continue. The first book of the Bible teaches that every man, every woman, is created in the image of God. This is the cornerstone of civil and honorable governments ruling on earth. Biblical values teach us the significance of a human being. It's not in their intellectual giftings, nor in their liberal abilities, not even in their economic status, but rather it is their image, for it is an impression of the image of the Supreme God. This requires then the Bible believer to constrain him or herself to treating others, even those they call their enemies, with the same dignity and respect as all. This idea is founded in the Constitution of the United States of America and in the Constitution of Canada. Genesis chapters 42 through 44 really uh, give us the history of how the Israelites came into Egypt, how they came to live there. And of course, this is the discourse between Joseph and his brothers uh, who sold them into slavery and they're finally coming to him for help because there's famine in the land, uh, even in Egypt, but Egypt is the only place that has food. And of course, that was all arranged by God through Joseph, which is extremely cool. Uh, but really, this sets the stage for one of the most famous biblical accounts ever. I'm talking about the Exodus, of course, with Moses. Because if the people never came into Egypt, then they would never have to leave Egypt. They would never have to go through the Exodus uh, period. And this time period when they're living in Egypt, the Israelites really are learning a lot from the Egyptian culture. And that comes out in some bad ways later on uh, in the wilderness wandering. One of these areas is the imagery of religious icons. 
In the ancient Middle East, the bull was known for its muscular strength and endurance. It was used in storytelling, art, and religious literature to convey power, strength, and productivity. Many ancient deities are actually portrayed as bulls or cows. The Canaanite supreme god El is shown as Father Bull El. His second in command and famously worshipped Baal is associated with and even shown as a bull, as is the Canaanite goddess Baalat, the mother or the mistress of Baal. In Egypt, there are at least two goddesses associated with bulls and cows. Hathor, who is shown as both a cow and a cow-headed woman, and Isis, shown as a woman with bull horns. With this imagery of strength and power and life, it is not surprising that bulls can also be found adorning the walls, buildings, and artwork of some of the most powerful nations in the ancient world. They were even used in Israel. The Sea of Bronze that was cast for use in the Temple of Solomon had for its base 12 bronze bulls. You know, God's purpose in our lives is it's never really about forgetting the past, but it's about re reconciling the past. You see, while Joseph named his two sons, his Egyptian sons, Manasseh, which means God has made me to forget, and Ephraim, which means I've been fruitful in affliction. The truth is God never lets us forget our past and makes us see our affliction as great times of growth. You see, if we forget our past, we lose to see a need for Jesus Christ in our personal history, our history of reconciling our sin with his blood on the cross. God desires us to learn from our past. And with the mind of Christ, seeing the affliction as it was, we welcome times of persecution and trials as times of growth and power. Genesis 43, verses 1 through 10. Now the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass, when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, Go back, buy us a little food. But Judah spoke to him, saying, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if he will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. And Israel said, Why did you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you still had another brother? But they said, The man asked us pointedly about ourselves and our family, saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told him according to these words. Could we possibly have known that he would say, bring your brother down? Then Judah said to Israel, his father, send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. From my hand, you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. For if we had not lingered, surely by now we would have returned the second time. Genesis chapter 43, verses 1 through 10. You know, the drama of this story is not going to go away, and for the next few days, we will study it. Today, as we begin the study of Joseph's saga, it is interesting to me in the book of Genesis that there are several chapters dedicated to the whole back and forth between Joseph, who was sold into slavery uh, by his brothers, and his brothers, who a famine in the land draws them back down to Egypt. See, Joseph, he thought his life was over. He had put in the past behind him. He didn't want to even think about his family again. And of course, uh, Jacob is up there in Canaan. He thinks his son is dead. 
and his brothers never want to see his brother Joseph again because they are the ones that sold him into slavery. But God has a way of reconciling things and putting the family back together. That is my message today. God has a way of putting things back together. Drawn out for healing. Genesis 43 verses 1 to 2 say this. Now the famine was severe up in Canaan, and it came to pass when they had eaten up all the grain which they had brought up from Egypt the first time, that their father Jacob said to them, Go back and buy us a little food. Now this is interesting. Our first power connection is this. In the heart and soul of God's people, no sin or offenses untreated without his attention. In other words, God draws us back. What I'm trying to say is you can't hide. <laughs> You, you may think, because time has gone by, you may think, well, you know, there's been all this time that's gone by. You may think that everything's gone, but it's not. Time does not heal all wounds. Jesus does. Time does not heal all wounds. Just because you forgot about it doesn't mean the offense is gone. In the spiritual realm of God's perfect mind, the offense must be dealt with. And so uh, he is drawing down through a famine, the family of Jacob, once again, to come back and see Joseph. This is fascinating. Now, the story gets better. Let's go to Genesis 43, verses 3 and 6. But, you know, Judas spoke to him, and he said, Well, the man, at the time it was Joseph, they didn't know that, he solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you, Benjamin. If you send out your brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you do not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, Dad, that's Jacob, son talking to Jacob, you shall not see my face unless my brother Benjamin is with you. Well, and Jacob, Israel said, why did you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell me the man whether you had uh, still had another brother? Very interesting. Why did you tell him our secret, guys? Well, this brings us to power connection number two. Sometimes we are drawn in to do things that we don't want to do, because God desires us to be reconciled. God's using the famine, and God's using their own secrets against them. But what's the purpose? Is God trying to, you know, get even? Is, is God somehow trying to say, well, see, I told you so, you shouldn't? No, God wants healing. God never does things to get even. He does things to, to bring healing to our lives. Now, this is a very important premise, and we see it right here in Genesis 43. Now, I want to go on, because I want to wrap this up at the end for a moment, but let's go to 43, 7 to 10. It says, but they said, well, the man asked us pointedly about ourselves. He asked us about our family, saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? He drew out the secrets from us. And we told him, according to these words, could we possibly have known that he would say, bring us, your, or bring down your brother? And then Judas said to Israel, his father, send the lad with me. I'll take the responsibility. We will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I myself, Judas said, I myself will be surety for him. From my hand you shall require of him if you do not bring him back. Hmm. And you set him before you. Then let me bear the blame forever. For if we had not lingered surely by now, we would have returned this second time. This is from Judah. Very interesting. Third power connection reconciliation always requires sacrifice and can never be done in convenience or comfort. So many times, beloved, we want to reconcile things at our convenience, but every confrontation requires a sacrifice of comfort. Now notice this is Judah. I want to point this out, and it's the tribe of Judah that Messiah comes from. He would give himself, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, he would give himself, the king of Israel, Malach of Israel, would give himself so that we could be reconciled to God. Do you see the image right here in Genesis? It's the gospel story right here in Genesis. Okay, that's seriously amazing, and that's cool. But what I want to say is this. Reconciliation does not come without sacrifice. Jesus Christ made it easy for us to pray and say, Lord, we want our, our sins to be taken away by you. But then he also said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your good and reasonable service. So salvation is not something cheap. 
It cost Jesus a great deal of blood, but it cost us servitude. And so you may think that you're a Christian, but if you haven't made Jesus Christ Lord of your life, I would challenge you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to think that one again. Think that through. Now, in our Just Thinking segment on the Internet, if you go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, we're going to talk about Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Think on these things. chapters of Genesis and, and all throughout the book of Exodus, Egypt is a really main player in the Bible. And it has come into the pages of the Bible before this with Abraham and his adventures in Egypt. And it will definitely come into play later throughout the time period of the kings. And it slowly declines. Now that matches with the history that we know of Egypt. Now, Egypt really seems to be a polarizing country. It's a country of life and a country of death. It's a country where people go to escape famines. And it's a country that God has to place a, a man that he called in order to save uh, of this country from, uh, really itself, from a, a famine that comes because the Nile River that they worshipped uh, failed uh, for them. And God had to save them from that, of course. Through Joseph. Now, uh, when they are living here in Egypt, uh, their culture is profoundly affected by Egypt, but that is why God pulls them out of Egypt so that He can re deprogram and reprogram their minds. This being said, we're going to take a look at Israelite culture in its place in history. <music> Archaeologists exploring settlements from the time of the kings of Israel have discovered that Israel seems to have borrowed Egyptian hieratic symbols, that's a form of Egyptian writing, to use for their record-keeping numerals. Also, the way the kings of Israel, specifically King Solomon, the way they divided up the land into districts with governors, can be seen mirrored in Egypt by Pharaoh Shishank, who is alive at the same time. It is possible that they borrowed the idea from each other, or more probably that they were simply following a popular functioning practice of the time. Either way, Israel is revealing itself more and more to be firmly placed within the pages of history. It was an entity alive at the same time as other cultures, and it did not stand on its own, but was influenced by and influenced others, just like our cultures today. Where did we all come from? Why are we here? Is life as we know it a simple accident? Is life as we know it a complex accident? Is our existence nothing more than a bucket of biochemicals thrashed about and voila, life comes out? Or is life the relationships we build in it? Love, joy, excitement, and much more. Quick Study Television is pleased to present Unlocking the Mysteries of Life, a careful video study of the mysteries of life focused on the other side of the evolutionary theory. Highly esteemed and powerful think tanks of scientists and philosophers in our modern world take you through an intellectual journey prepared with brilliant cinematography and strange but beautiful creatures. When you support Quick Study TV this month with a generous gift at any amount, we'll send you this stunning documentary called Unlocking the Mysteries of Life. We are deeply encouraged by your offerings and support. Will you consider us today? Please write to P.O. Box 150, Marysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. Or in Canada and internationally to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2.
According to Dr. Gleason L. Archer, the Old Testament of the Bible contains approximately 200 scripture texts that are predictive. Many of them tell with remarkable accuracy the major events of kingdoms in the ancient times. There are also 600 different topics that the Old Testament predicts in its prophecies. According to the Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy, the Old Testament predicts at least 127 events pertaining to the last days we now live in. We live in a time when the Old Testament of the Bible is more relevant than it ever has been, so it seems. You know, God has spent a lot of time in prison. Every man or woman who has been incarcerated for the faith counts as Jesus Christ himself being in prison. He will never leave us or forsake us. Now, there are times of divine jailbreaks, as the apostles learned, and then there are times when God heals the broken in jail through us, as Paul did with Onesimus. Now, God frequents the spaces of human depravity. As such was the ministry of Joseph, the son of Jacob. By the way, the word penitentiary means the secure place for penance. Now, if penitent souls are in prison, God is in prison with them. As a matter of fact, we see that some of the most amazing sermons Paul ever wrote were in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the letters or the prison letters, Paul says, remember my chains. Mm -hmm. A very interesting point, and I think that um, we need to be aware that it doesn't matter who we are or where we are, we may be in our own prison emotionally. We may be in our own prison confined through physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. But God's purpose, we learn in Joseph's life, God has a purpose for him there, and God uses him there yes, to does. touch the lives of people. No one is confined to any space that God cannot use them in. Mm -hmm. And so I want to encourage our friends, and there are many of them, who are struggling with physical disabilities, you are not rendered powerless or purposeless. Jesus Christ has a plan for you no matter where you are with what you have. Take that message that Joseph being confined to prison, feeling like he has no power, yet it is in this space where he touches so many lives. Mm -hmm. God brought him there for that reason. Look around you. Who is around you that you can touch with the message of Jesus Christ. Very, very important lesson we learned from Joseph. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get to the Bible challenge. All right. Joseph had a meal prepared for his brothers. How many times more was Benjamin serving than his brothers? Was his two times more, five times more, or ten times more? What do you think, Corey? Oh, man. I'm thinking right now either five or ten. I can't remember, so I'm going to go with five. No. What do you think? Hmm. Genesis 43, verse 34 tells us that it was five times more. Good that job. Was close. Good job. <laughs> just you pause did really there well, man. just for a little bit of excitement. Yeah, that was that. Thanks. I thought I got that wrong when you yeah. paused. Nope. Five, <laughs> Sliding five right times in that more. groove, most excellent. For his course. little brother, <laughs> Benjamin. On our Just Thinking segment today on the internet, if you want to tune in and uh, support us there, we're going to be talking about the power of confession on Just Thinking. It's tied to today's program because Joseph is confessing to his brothers who he is. Mm -hmm. And there is a powerful release of forgiveness that comes when he confesses what God meant or what you meant for evil, God turns to good. Mm -hmm. And there is something about the confession of the mouth. Well, today we talk about it from 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 to 10 on the Just Thinking segment on the Internet. How can they get a hold of the Just Thinking segment? Well, you go online, correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't done this yet, and after today, I'm going to check this out. Get online and uh, become a, a, a partner. Or by giving. By That's giving right. online, and you can become a part of this extra teaching. It takes you to a page, and then you can become a part uh, that, of that monthly. You get the Bible guides free. Uh, not free, but get the Bible guides after you've done it. You have the pocket guide there for the e-readers, and you have all the stuff there for handouts for your Bible studies if you want to use them. 
And then there is this extra teaching that we do specifically for those on BibleDiscoveryTV.com. We do need your support and your help. Thank you to all, everyone who is involved, and thank you to the TV partners who have joined us. It's because of you that we can stay on the station. And I want to mention that Marjorie says, I want to praise God for what He is doing in my family. Now, Marjorie comes and she says, I want to enter His gates with thanksgiving first. So I want to praise God for what He's doing in my family, but I would like you to please continue to pray for His guidance in my life. So Marjorie, we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for touching Marjorie's life. She wishes to thank you. We do. We join her in that praise. And now, Lord, she's asking for wisdom and for knowledge and for guidance. And so help her today. We join with her, one of our partners, Marjorie, to do so. In Jesus' name, amen. Watch and Pray is a segment where you can pray also for those who support this program. Please pray with them. You can't just sweep things under the carpet. Uh, there, there has to be a reconciliation. Now, one of the names of God is Redeemer. Do you know what that means? That means that God can take whatever has happened to you and change it. Turn it into Him, and He will redeem it and give you a new start. That's what the name Redeemer means. That's what the cross was all about. We have inherited the sin line because Adam and Eve fell. They resisted God, all of sin, and come short of the glory of God. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so, if we choose to take Jesus Christ as our Lord, then we get a second chance. We get a chance to change our lives, to live for God's eternal purpose, rather than just have a blast while we last. I encourage you today to come to Jesus Christ and know Him and find out who you really are.